tonight, chapter number three, making Jesus Lord. So, in your books, chapter number three, making Jesus Lord. This is an important chapter, as all of them are important. But this is something that we have to do continually. Once you give your life to Jesus, you acknowledge him as the Lord, and certainly the Lord of your life. And that's not, not easy. It's easier said than done. It really is. When you choose to give your life to Jesus, you choose to follow him. He said, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He would say again, come and be my disciple. And uh, a disciple means one who will learn at any cost. And so when you make Jesus Lord, you choose to follow him. Not the ways of your old life, not the ways of the world, but Jesus. And his way is a very constrictive way. There in Matthew chapter 7, he talked about two roads, one narrow, one wide. And he said that those who travel the wide road to the broad gate, there are many that go on that road. In fact, most people do. But compared to that road, there's the narrow road that goes through the narrow gate. And so he said there are few who are on that road. Why? Because most people don't want to go on that road because the cost is too great. And indeed, to follow Jesus, there is a cost, a great cost, because you know, we live in a world that opposes Jesus and those who would follow him. And so making Jesus Lord puts you automatically in the minority. But nonetheless, our challenge, lifetime challenge, is to follow Jesus and be his disciple. And be willing to go through whatever is necessary so that he might finish his work that he began in our lives. So why is it important that Jesus be the Lord of our lives? First of all, because he alone is worthy. God has given him a name which is above every name. Now, the name is not necessarily just the name Jesus, even though that is important. But in this context, that name represents the individual, his reputation. You know, if I were to throw some names out there, like Adolf Hitler, well, automatically a certain character would come to mind, right? And so name means more than just, you know, several letters thrown together. It means who that person is. And when we come to the name of Jesus, my goodness, we could go on and on and on what that name represents. But there in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, God's word says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now let me just point out that everyone at some point in time will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord. Now we have the opportunity today to do that during this what we call the age of grace where we can do that with total freedom of our own free will to do that for those who refuse to do that there will come a day in judgment where they will have to bow their knee towards Jesus and confess that he indeed is God and Lord unfortunately he won't be their savior he will be their judge but everyone will bow their knee to him and so praise the Lord in this wonderful age of grace, God has drawn you to himself, and of your own free will, you have bowed your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and relinquished your life and handed over into his hand. Now, God says he has given him a name which is above every name. I find it so interesting that this greatest name, Jesus, the sweetest name there is, the name that represents love, the epitome of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness and all those good things that we like, that name so often is drug in the dirt. There's hardly a movie made today without somewhere out of complete context that name is drug into the dirt and is blasphemed. It becomes a curse word. I always look at that and I think, well, you know, this is the evidence that the devil is very much alive on planet Earth because why is it always the name of Jesus? When someone, you know, hits their thumb with a hammer, why don't they say Muhammad or, you know, something like that? <laughs> why does Jesus become now the curse word when it represents the most wonderful things of all? I don't know. Why don't they say Buddha, you know? 
Why isn't that a curse word? Because Satan knows what that name represents, and he's out to, def to oppose it in any way that he can. But Jesus represents the greatest name, and God has declared it so. And yet, for most people, it's one of the most difficult names to lift up. It's very easy to say, well, God bless you, at least by those who live in the White House through the years. God bless you, God bless you, but when's the last time you ever heard anyone living there mention the name of Jesus? There's a spiritual war going on. And more and more, we're finding that name under attack. And those who follow Jesus are also going to be victims of that whole thing. And yet, it was through Jesus where we find the greatest demonstration of, lo of love of all. In fact, Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this and for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Who else has done that for you? Laid down his life for you. The greatest demonstration of all. In so doing, he purchased you. You came at a high price, believe it or not. In fact, you are almost invaluable, priceless. Because in order for God to redeem you and me, it cost him the life of his son Jesus. So what would the life of Jesus equal in an amount? Well, you can't fix a price to it, right? But if it required the death of Jesus in order for God to purchase you and I, therefore I would say in God's eyes we're somewhat priceless. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought at a price, and on the basis of that great price, therefore, we are to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which belong to the Lord. We are God's property. We are God's possession. I mean, you could get yourself a t-shirt and say, I'm God's property, and that would be proper. We belong to him. We were bought at a great price. <coughs> if you ever want to know how much God loves you, just look at the price of his son and what God had to spend on you and I. Priceless. Moreover, it's important to make Jesus Lord because he's the only source of life. We all want life. We all want the, the, the blessings that come from the Lord, right? And you can only find that in Jesus. Jesus said, you know, the thief has only come to steal and to kill and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. In contrast, what did Jesus say here? He's making a contrast between Satan and himself. The thief, who is Satan, he's come to steal and to kill and destroy. That's what he's up to. That's his, that's his game. But for Jesus, he's come to give life and to that more abundantly. A little girl was asked years ago, you know, what does this word abundant mean, this abundant life? And she said, oh, overflowing. And that's indeed what it is. That's the, the, that's the quality of life that Jesus has come to give to us. Imagine a container. You would have a container. Hello, New Believers class? Yes. Okay, we'll try to find a spot somewhere around there. Uh, Vic, you want to get up and get a book like behind you there? Give it to her? And pass the name tag and the sign-up sheet. You'll be getting a book in just a moment here, and we're just beginning in chapter 3. So, imagine having a container, say a five-gallon container in front of you. And next to that, you had another container that was infinitely large. In other words, no end to it. And it was filled with some kind of a liquid, say water. And so you took this simply large container and you begin to pour the water into this five gallon container. What would happen in a matter of a short period of time? It would just begin to overflow, right? And it would overflow indefinitely. That's the life that Jesus has come to give. You see, God is an infinite God. There's no end to him. There's no end to his love. There's no end to his mercy and grace. There's no end to his being whatsoever. He is infinite. Our minds can't comprehend that, but that's who he is. And so when Jesus came to give life to us, he came with an unending source. We are finite beings. We can be measured to some degree. And Jesus wants to pour all of his life, which has no end, into us. Which says to me, when I think about that, I think 
When we allow Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, to have full control and be the master of us, there is no room for emptiness. There's no room for depression and all those things that people fought, fight with constantly. You know, it's been said here in America that 60% of the people fight, you know, chronic depression. It's because they don't have Jesus. How can you be depressed if you have the fullness of life in you? It's only when you set Jesus aside that you get into that kind of a situation. He's the only source of life. He said, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except by me. The Father God is the creator, the only creator. He created you and I. He sustains us throughout every day as he does the entire universe. You can't find life anywhere else except from him. And the only way to get that life is through Jesus because he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. So you have to go through Jesus in order to get there, to get life. Why? Because he is God's atonement for our sin. We're sinners, as we saw last week. And so thus, in order to get that life, we have to go through Jesus, who is that one and only one who satisfied God's requirement of his law to atone for our sins so that he can forgive us. Why is it important to make Jesus Lord? Because he alone is worthy. He purchased you and I with his blood at great price. And he's the only source of life. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't get it from entertainment in the world. You can't get it from money. You can't get it position and fame. It'll all be so temporary, isn't it? It comes and goes. And uh, yet Jesus remains the same. Practically speaking, how do you make Jesus Lord? Now here's where the rubber hits the road. This is the tough one. And it's not just one of those once and for all things. It's something that we do, we must do actually every single day throughout the day, making Jesus Lord. Because as we'll see in this next chapter on spiritual warfare, there's this battle that you and I engage in every single day. It's that battle between ourselves, the flesh, and the devil. And so we are constantly fighting this battle. And many times we lose, we sin. And so thus we have to get back in that right relationship with God through confession and through his forgiveness and once again establish him as the Lord of our lives. Now Jesus is the example of it all. He was perfectly submissive to his Father. Not once did Jesus ever do his own will while he was alive upon this earth in his human body. He always submitted to his Father. Always. If he had ever had one moment where he did his own will and did not submit to his Father, he would have sinned. And you and I would have been hopeless forever. But because he was obedient and submitted to the Heavenly Father at all times, therefore he was that perfect sacrifice that became acceptable before God to atone for our sins. There in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. And you read about it there as the night that he was betrayed. We're told he went a little farther and he fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup, this cup of suffering, pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, we're told a second time he prayed. He said, oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He was ready to go through no matter the cost. He was ready to pay the price. Absolute obedience to his father. Now, in contrast to Jesus, the perfect example when it comes to obedience and submission, we have his arch enemy, Satan, and there in Isaiah chapter 14, we have the record of Satan's fall. Now, Satan was one of God's good angels. In fact, in all probability, Satan, who was formerly known as Lucifer, was probably the, the prime example of perfection in God's creation. But one day he fell away from that relationship that he had with God because of selfish motives. And so we have the account written down for us in Isaiah chapter 14 where we read, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning! How you are cut down to the ground! You who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now as you go through those verses, you can easily... Note the, the many I wills that are there. I will, I will, I will, I will. 
That is Satan's calling card. He's all about self. All about self, whereas Jesus is just the opposite. Not my will, but your will be done. Now you see, we are kind of caught in between. Where every day we go out through, through every day making choices. Are we going to do my will like Satan wants me to do? Or am I going to submit to the Father and do his will? And that's where, you know, a lot of disciplined Bible study has to come in. A lot of prayer life has to come in, developing that relationship with God so that he can then do that work in our hearts so that, by, like Jesus, we'll want to do his will. We'll want to give up our lives, making Jesus the Lord of our lives and become those selfless kinds of individuals where it, it's all important to do, to do the will of the Father. Another aspect of making Jesus Lord is denying ourselves denying ourselves. Now our old nature, the sin nature, which we'll be talking about more in the next chapter, does not want to not deny ourselves. It wants to satisfy and please ourselves at all times, at all costs. But Jesus said, in fact, here's our memory verse that Vicki quoted earlier, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things are become new. When you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm sure that many of you have done that just in recent months or maybe recent years, that there is automatically this transformation that takes place in your life. Prior to coming to Jesus Christ, no doubt you were driven by selfish motives and desires. But when you come to Jesus, suddenly God begins to work in you where all that is reversed. And you want to do His will. And suddenly you have this great uh, compassion in your heart to reach out to people and to minister to others. And that's the work of God's Spirit. So that's the new life that he's come to give. So it means relinquishing old activities, turning loose of old habits of the past. Not only old activities and habits of the past, but sometimes we have to turn loose of old acquaintances. Blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, we're told in Psalm 1, verse 1. We no longer run with the old friends of the past. In fact, we should not. And sometimes it makes, uh, make it, it requires us to make a very difficult and hard choice. I know for me, when I got saved as a young teenager, I ran around with a lot of friends prior to my salvation. But when I got saved, the Lord began a work in me that changed me completely. And I no longer wanted to be with those old friends of the past. I mean, they were okay friends and those, all that, but they didn't know Jesus. And I wanted to hang around with, with friends who knew and loved Jesus. And it was just a, a, a black and white change for me. And, uh, you know, even my family who didn't know the Lord, I even had a difficult relating to, to them because of that change that took place in my life. In fact, as believers, we're told in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. <coughs> well, you know, if you picture in your history of minds, you know what a yoke is, a, this wooden thing, that apparatus that they put around a couple of oxen so that they both go in the same direction. That's the term that's being used here. And so we're told that we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. To be yoked with an unbeliever, we would be unequally yoked because we are a believer and they are not a believer black and white and you can't both go in the same direction in other words the, the unbeliever won't go in your direction that you need to go in because you know it's going to all going to seem so foolishness to him and for him to to go in his direction where he wants to go would compromise your walk so you can't do that so important instructions we have to separate ourselves from that old life if you read the old testament when god you know, deliver the, the Israelites out of Egypt. He called them forth to be a holy and sanctified people. They were to be a different nation than every other nation upon the, upon the face of the earth because God is a holy God. And for us to have a relationship with him, it also has to be a holy relationship. There's a great verse that I think about so often. Uh, where is it? In the book of Amos. How can two walk together unless they're agreed? Well, if I'm going to agree with God, I've got to walk with Him. I can't disagree with God and still walk with Him. And He's not going to change for my sake. So therefore, if I'm going to walk with the Lord, I've got to go His way. And He's not going to go my way. So we cannot be unequally yoked. So, also means relinquishing old habits. 
We're told in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, therefore put to death, in other words, put out of business your members which are upon the earth. And these are sinful acts, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covenants, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now, sons of disobedience is a term that's often used in Paul's epistles. It always refers to unbelievers. They are sons of disobedience because they don't obey God. Now, you've come to obey the Lord. But those who don't know the Lord do not obey Him. Now, we're told that we once walked with those sons of disobedience or unbelievers, but now we've been changed. So, therefore, we're now to put on all these things, put off these things as well. Anger, wrath, malice, that's wanting to get even, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man and his deeds. So once again, that new creature in Jesus Christ, old things have passed away, behold, all things are become new. And this, there should be actions, behavior patterns that should change, no longer be a part of our lives. And people should be able to note that as they observe our lives. Then Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, here's the mission impossible. Should you accept this mission? Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now in the context of that day, 2,000 years ago, the cross was a very common scene, especially there in Jerusalem. Josephus used to, he would he write in his, in his hist historical books that there in, the, in Israel that the Romans would crucify thousands of people. So it was a real common thing. That was the means of capital punishment in that day. And so what Jesus used in that terminology related very clearly to the disciples and to the others who were living at that time. Now, if he were living today, he probably would not use the word cross, even though he died upon that. He would have used other means, maybe the injection needle, I don't know what it would have been. But he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. In other words, death to self, death to the old life. Paul would say, for I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ now lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The crucified life. The crucified life. That's something that you have to recognize every single day. And when we fall, in which case we do, we have to go back to the Lord. Lord, I give you my life. I want to follow you. Help me to deny myself so that your life might come through. How does all this come about? Well, obedience to the Word of God. You've got to have an instruction manual, right? And God has given that to us in His Word so that we'll know what He requires of us and what He wants us to do in order to obey Him. We're told in Colossians 3.10 as we continue on from the previous verses, you've put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of Him who created Him. How do we get to know the Lord? It's through His Word. And as we get to know Him, then we have that desire to want to follow him and obey, obey him. Continuing on in Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as the elect of God, God chose you out of this world, by the way. You know, you're all very privileged. God chose you, we're told according to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, that he chose us all before the foundations of the world, before the world began. God who dwells outside of time and knows all things, and because he is... He is eternal and knows all things. It's impossible for him to, to learn anything. Therefore, God could easily say before the world began, I chose you and you and you and you and you to be my very own. And so you were called by God. That's what we're told. So we're told the elect of God, holy and beloved, therefore you are to put on tender mercies. You are to be kind to one another. You are to take on humility, not pride, but humility, meekness, long suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. But above all, these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Love covers a multitude of sins. It's the greatest attribute that we can have, is that love of God in our hearts. So we obey the word of God. <coughs> Here at Morningstar, as you probably have noted by now, one of the main things we do is teach the Bible. We cannot teach it enough. Over and over again, we teach the scriptures because we need to know it. We tend to forget things, and we have to be reminded frequently, right? In order to remember things, a repeatability thing. And so therefore, we keep teaching, we keep teaching, we keep teaching. 
That's an awesome thing. Once that work of God and his grace takes over in our lives, those changes continue. As I said earlier, before we come to Christ, we are very selfish creatures. We want to be served rather than to serve. But when Jesus comes into our life, and because he is a servant, and he takes over our life and becomes the Lord of our life, over the course of time, we will want to begin to serve. Because that's who the nature, that's the nature of Jesus. And if he's living in us, he'll want to serve through us. And so we begin to serve with all of our hearts. We're told, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added or given to us. Seek first the kingdom of God. What are God's priorities? He wants to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ for sure. And uh, he will want to use you to accomplish that in some way or another. When Jesus was with his disciples, one day he called them all to himself and he said to them, he says, now you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, that is like kings and so forth, they lord their power over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet, it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. You see, the kingdom of God is what I call the upside-down kingdom. It's just the opposite of man's kingdom. It's like this. You know, here's man's kingdom, right? You think of the, the skyscrapers downtown L.A. or New York City or wherever it is. Who has the office up here? Huh? The CEO, right? Right, the big guy, big shot, right? And who has the, the little office down in the basement? Yeah, the cleaning crew. The cleaning crew, yeah, the janitor, right? Yeah. Now, the kingdom of God, it's like this. And you know who's at the peak down here? Jesus. <laughs> He's at the lowest point. And uh, then you go up from there. Because he said, notice here, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever desires to be great shall become your servant. In other words, the janitor, right? Only over here is Jesus, and those who are more and more like him, they're at the bottom. Those who are the greatest in the kingdom of God serve the most people. They serve the most people. Jesus outserved us all, certainly. Whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave of all. Boy, that's very different than man's idea of a kingdom, right? Man's idea of a kingdom is whoever has the most power and money and influence and so forth, they're at the top. And they can demand people to serve them everywhere. Servants galore underneath them. But not so in the kingdom of God. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, the upside-down kingdom, the upside-down kingdom, is just the reverse of man's kingdom. <clears throat> Jesus is the servant of all, the greatest servant of all, the greatest servant of all. And he's come to serve you and I. And as we saw earlier in this chapter, he gave his life for us. There's no greater love, no greater demonstration of love than for a man to lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus has to be the greatest servant, right? Because he paid the greatest price. So, making Jesus Lord, making Jesus Lord, there's really no option here. But it's something we have to continue to do every day of our lives, reaffirming that Jesus is the Lord of all. Okay.